Hi there. In this video, I'll guide you through a demonstration of the web user interface on the EE Smart Hub Plus. This will cover navigating around the user interface, where to find things that might be of interest, and any limitations that I've discovered after using it for almost a year. If you like the video, please click or tap the like button and consider subscribing. Now, let's go over what you'll need to access the web interface. First, you'll need to be connected to the EE Smart Hub Plus. This can be by either Wi-Fi or a wired connection, it doesn't matter. A web browser, any Chrome-based browser, Firefox or Safari will be fine. Next, you'll need the settings card from the back of the Smart Hub Plus. This card has both the Wi-Fi credentials and the admin password for the web interface. And lastly, the IP address for the Smart Hub Plus. By default, this should be 192.168.1.254 if it hasn't been changed. If that address doesn't work, you can look up what the IP address is on your operating system's network settings and take note of the IP address for the gateway of the network interface you are using. With that covered, let's begin. Okay, so I've got a web browser open. For myself, I'll be using Firefox for this demonstration, but like I said, you can use any Chrome browser, Safari, whichever you've got. I'm just going to put in the IP address of the router. And we're up and running. I'll just zoom in a little bit. Okay, so this is the default view that you'll end up seeing. You've got a number of tiles that you can click on. Pretty straightforward interface. I'll go through these one by one and show you what they look like. Now, first off, you've got to search so you can basically type what you're looking for. Let's try restart the hub. Just type in a few letters in, automatically detected it. And if I click on one of these, it'll go wherever it needs to go. So if I click on restart the hub, it'll prompt me for the admin password. Next up, we've got status. So we see that the device is connected, the connection type. So I'm on fiber to the cabinet, so I'm not able to get the best speeds available at the moment, but hopefully that'll change next year. We've got app version, firmware version. So I'm recording this on the 6th of June, 2025. So that's the version that I've got installed. And we've got the serial number, and then we've got the downstream speed, the upstream speed, network uptime, system uptime. So there's three ways you can get back to the home screen. One, click on home. Number two, click back. And number three, just press the mouse back button if you've got one. Uh, next, I'll go through the help section. This is pretty straightforward. So we've got a few wizards to just help try and diagnose things. Uh, we've got an FAQ and we've got a user's guide. It, it does an okay job, I suppose, to teach you how to use it initially. Then we've got hub light control. So what this allows you to do is turn the light on the front of the hub off if you want to. But as it describes here, if you've got the hub's light turned off and there's a problem, the light will come on. Even in the event that you have turned this off, it will still come on if the actual connection drops. Also, when you restart the router, if you have to, show the LED when it was it's starting up. So just bear that in mind. Next up, broadband performance test. This is absolutely useless. The reason for it is it just basically wants you to install an app on your phone. I don't see what the point of that is. Just put a link to speedtest.net or something in there and make it a hell of a lot easier. But to be brutally honest, if you want to do a speed test, just open a new tab up and do a speed test. We've got guest Wi-Fi. I don't have this configured and it will ask you to put your admin password in. I'm not going to do that yet because I need to show a few other bits. Then we've got wireless settings. You can see I've got a basic network setting. So our network name, we've got the two speeds available. So the network name for both speeds actually is the same. So there's no switching really between the two. We've got the channels that are using, what the WPA version is. Then we've got a compatible Wi-Fi. This is off by default. The only reason I ever turned this on was because I had a bunch of Raspberry Pi Pico 2s, which required, I think it was a wireless N network, which this main Wi-Fi section didn't actually supply. So you have to turn compatible Wi-Fi on to get that. And then it creates another network name, which is basically the same as this one. However, though, it just tags on dash comp at the end. That's totally optional. That's by default turned off. I'll return to that one later because there's other settings that you can see once we've got an admin password put in. Then we've got hybrid connection. I don't have this. So this, this is just basically to allow you to connect up a 4G modem. And in the event that your main connection goes down, it'll just flick over to that. And then we've got my network. 
which gives you a, a map of what's connected to your network. But if you click on one of these, you can actually break it down by the connection type. So, so if I just click on wireless connections, it filters down what's connected to the Wi-Fi. And then get back to it, I just click on the hub. And then we can look at what 2.4 gig devices we've got, 5 gig and Wi-Fi extenders. I don't have any Wi-Fi extenders. I don't have any 2.4 gigahertz devices attached at the moment. So I've only got two 5 gig devices. And if I click on that, I can filter those down further. And I don't have to go through that either. I can just go straight to 5 gig and be able to see what's there. And a similar thing for the uh, Ethernet connection. So these are the wired connections. So I can filter that out. Not much on the network at the moment. Well, network switch. I believe that is a Nintendo Switch. And that's an Apple TV 4K. If I click on one of them, delve into what the actual settings are for each one. So the device name, that's not the actual device name. That's just the device type. So I assume it's, this hub's got a built-in database, which just shows whatever the actual item is because my Apple TV is not named that. Now the connection status, IP address, MAC address, connection type, address assignment. And if I wanted to, you can just flick this once. If I do it now, it won't work. But once I go into the advanced mode later on, I can actually go in here and I can always assign that IP address to it. So it's just making a reservation in the DHCP server that's built in. Then we've got IP v 6 settings. And I can change settings in here as well. I could just click on change settings, but it'll ask me to enter the admin password. That's fine. I'm not going to do that at this point. I'll just go back to the advanced mode. And that just leaves these two sections here. So we've got restart the hub. That basically does what it says on the tin. You click it, it asks you to enter the password, restarts the hub. And then we've got advanced settings. Once you've got into here, if you click on pretty much anything apart from, I think, maybe back to home page, it'll ask you for the admin password. So if I just click on broadband, it'll ask for the password. Just click OK because I need to do that now. And it's very similar to what we've got before in terms of information, but we can actually start making changes. It also shows other things as well, like broadband username, which I think is just a generic one anyway. It also shows like what the IP address is of your broadband connection. Uh, the DNS servers that it's, it's using as well. And just some advanced settings for any VPNs that you might be using. This device doesn't act as a VPN service. It's just purely whatever VPN service you're using as a third party product, maybe it's software, maybe it's a hardware device. This is about the only setting you've got for VPN on here. Then we've got dynamic DNS resolution. This is off by default. And I think in most people's cases, this is going to be fine. If you turn it off, it'll ask you for things like the username, password, and what the service is. So I think I've used no IP in the past, so that's pretty straightforward. But again, this is something that is up to you if you want to use it or not. So technical log, that's pretty much most of the settings for your device. Nothing really much to see there that we haven't already seen. Event log, that just basically gives you a breakdown of what's happened and when it's happened, what's connected, what's disconnected. And of course, you can actually download it. If you click on export, it'll then just download all those entries as a CSV file. And anytime you see the export button, it will download it as a CSV file. If we go into wireless now. So in wireless, we can actually now adjust the network name and change the security type, go all the way up to WPA3 personal if we want, change the password, turn WPS off, also turn off 2.4 or 5 gig if we want, change the channel number, which for five gigahertz is not an option. You basically just have to rescan and it'll sort itself out. And if you click on compatible Wi-Fi, if you want that to be available, then you can just click it on. It'll come up with all the settings for that, which pretty much are very similar to what we just saw. I'm not interested in turning that on. And then we've got Wi-Fi extenders. I don't have any, so it's probably going to turn around and say none. But you can add a new Wi-Fi extender here if you wanted to. And it just gives you the instructions as to how to set that up. I've got my network. And as you can see, we've got pretty much the same thing again. I'm going to go to the Apple TV 4K this time. And I can now say, always use this IP address. And then if I click save, that'll take effect. So now that IP address has now changed from being grayed out to actually being a clickable drop down. So I can actually change it if I want to. So when this actually starts up, gets the DHCP IP address from this particular device, it will always be that. Next up, we've got IPv4 configuration. By default, the IP address of the router is 192.168.1.254, subnet mask of 255.255.255.0. You can now change this if you want. I mean, most routers by default usually end in one as opposed to 254, but that's not the case for this particular one. 
You can turn off DHCP server. You can change the DHCP range that is available. Change the lease time. So, so how long will an IP address be leased out to a device for? So in this case, by default, it's one day. And then DNS servers are set to auto. I could turn that off. I could set my own IP addresses for which DNS servers I wanted to use. So instead of the E provided ones, I could maybe use 1.1.1.1 or maybe even Google's, I think it's 8.8.8.8 for one of them. And then I think the second one was 8.8.0.0 or something. I can't remember off the top of my head. I'm not going to do that for now. So I'll just leave that as is. Then we've got an address table. Uh, this is just all the IPv4s and IPv6 addresses that have been leased and which have expired. Then we've got firewall. So we can do port forwarding. So if you need to take something, I don't know, like an old game server, for example, that you're hosting and need to let people in to your network to be able to connect to it, you can set up a port forwarding rule to allow that. That's pretty straightforward. You just click new port forwarding rule, give it a name. So let's go Quake server. Use an IP address, which will be the target. So I'll just choose this. And then external port, what port number is it going to come in at? If there's a range, so if it's, let's make this up and just go 8080, end 8080. Then the internal could be somewhat like 5050, 5050. Protocol, if it's just a TCP one or a UDP one, just select them individually. Or if you don't know, just to select TCP slash UDP. I'll just go with that for now. And then pretty much you just click save. And then anything that tries to connect onto your network from port 8080 externally, it'll redirect port 5050 to that device that you've specified. I'm not going to do that because I've got no use for this, but I just thought I'd show you how you can do it. And then lastly for firewall, you can configure UPnP and by default that's already on. So it's up to you if you want to turn that off or not. DMZ, probably best not to touch this unless you actually know what you're doing. So really, unless you've got a very good reason to do it, probably best not to have a look at this, but the capability is there. One thing I did notice as well is it's actually not nagging me to save things. So when I click back on that last one, even after I've made that change, it didn't nag me to save it. So if we go back in, see that port forwarding rules not there. Just be aware that if you do need to do something like this or make any change, once you've done it, click save, because if you click back and you haven't saved it, it won't tell you. So just be aware of that. Let's have a look at system. So pretty straightforward here. You can just set a new admin password and then you can factory reset you up to its defaults. IPv6, let's have a look at that. This is just giving you some information about the IPv6 settings. So nothing really much there. And this is just basically the settings for IPv6 to work on your network. If you need to turn it off, you can do. If you don't, then you don't need to, in which case just leave it on. Lastly, for IPv6, we've got pinholes. Uh, reading this, it's basically the same thing as a port forwarding rule. So if I just create an IPv6 pinhole, give it a name, give it a device, and then best basically specify the external ports, start and end, what the protocol is, and that's about it. I've never used this, so I can't really say if it actually does work or not, but your mileage may vary. And lastly, let's look at access control. Or not, because you need the app installed to be able to do it. And by app, it's the mobile app. So there's not really much to see there. So that's the advanced settings covered. We go back home, nothing new. So nothing's really changed on the home screen. So if I now just click on Guess Wi-Fi and select Yes, it now gives me a new Wi-Fi network that I can select for people to use. I just visiting, for example. I didn't need to put a password in because I'm already logged in as the admin from when I went through the advanced settings. Now, I'm not going to do that because I don't need it. And now, if I click on Change Settings in the Wi-Fi section, it'll just take me to basically the advanced settings because I'm already logged in. And that's it for the overview of the uh, admin interface on the Smart Hub Plus. It's a relatively straightforward interface. It's relatively cleaner than some of the previous routers I've used. It's pretty quick. I think the transitions could be a little bit faster, but that's fine. One limitation of this device that still exists since I got it originally is that you can't do file or print sharing natively on this device. It still doesn't support it. Even though there's a USB port on the back, it can't be used. The only thing I've been able to use it for is to power maybe a Raspberry Pi or maybe even use it to charge something. But other than that, it's not usable at all. So bear that in mind. It's not designed to do file serving at all. 
if you want to do that with this device, you'll need a separate NAS box or maybe something like a Raspberry Pi doing file sharing. But otherwise, that's it for the tour. If you like the video, please give it a thumbs up and consider subscribing. And for now, leave it at that. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.